Well, welcome. We're glad that you're uh, with us this morning. Uh, we have been in a, a series uh, called The Power to Change that we started on Easter because we believe it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us the power to change into what he wants us to be. Amen? Resurrection is the most powerful thing that's ever happened in the history of the world uh, because it can actually change a life. Sometimes we think of power as something that's destructive, an atomic bomb. Wow, that's a lot of power. But the greatest power is not the power to destroy. The greatest power is to bring life. Amen? And, th and that's what God does in all of that. And so um, last week we kind of talked a little bit about uh, creating lasting change uh, in all of that. And I want to kind of go back a little bit and, and, um, and kind of revisit some of that before we launch into what we're going to talk about uh, today. And we kind of talked about Romans chapter 12. Uh, Romans chapter 12 works better if you turn this on, uh, <laughs> uh, says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Okay, that's kind of the old thing, the, the destructive things, the sinful thing, things, but be transformed, okay, both the formation, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve God, what's God's will, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And God's will is always good, perfect, and pleasing, Amen. You know, our will, we think is going to be good, perfect, and pleasing, but we have a tendency to go sideways, we have a tendency to get in trouble, and then it's not good, pleasing, and perfect. I'm going to cough here. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the thing I just kind of want to remind you that we're going to launch from this into what we're going to talk about is that the, the be transformed. Um, and and um, I told you that in the original language, uh, there's a tense that we don't really have in English. Uh, and all of my life growing up, when I read be transformed, I thought about when we get saved. We're transformed. God, Christ comes into our life. It, it, it's good. Something that happened in the past. But in the original language, be transformed would probably be better be, be being transformed. It carries the idea, you were transformed when you came into relationship with Christ. And now you are going to continue to be transformed all of the rest of your life. God is constantly moving and making you more like Christ every day, uh, all, all the time. And the transformed word there is the word from which we get metamorphosis. And we kind of talked about, you know, um, uh, butterflies and, and caterpillars and all of that. Uh, and so what I just kind of step back to that, you know how a butterfly becomes or how a, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly? It's through one of these, a chrysalis. I uh, say chrysalis. So there's a sense in which the big change doesn't happen as a, as a, you know, a butterfly, and the big change doesn't happen uh, as, as, you know, this little wormy, ugly thing that we have, you know. Uh, but it's in the chrysalis. So what I want to talk a little bit about is the chrysalis of change. It is in the chrysalis that, that, that we are changed. So say chrysalis of change. Yeah. Um, and so... The deal for the, for the caterpillar is, you know, I don't know what caterpillars think, but I doubt that any caterpillar has any kind of a guess as to what he's going to come out like on the other end, right? You know, he just has this urge to build a box and live upside down for a while in it. You know, that's just, the you know, caterpillars, they have that thing in their life. And, and so they just kind of go and, and do that, um, uh, not knowing what the future holds for them. And in some sense, that's very much like us in the, begin, the process of change a little bit. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. If you have a physical one or on your phone or in our app, wherever you have that, or you can just watch. We'll put the, the scripture up here as we move along through uh, the notes and all of that. So we too struggle with this, what are we going to become sort of thing. And, and um, we tend to be people who we want to know what the end is before we start the process, right? You know, make sure we're on the right path. Everybody, you know, that, that's just the way we're wired out. But that's not the way this works. In fact, look at what 1 John says. 1 John 3, 2 says, dear friends, now we are children of God. Woohoo! A <laughs> little early this morning? Okay, let me try it again. Now we are children of God. There we go. Yeah, that is good news. You are a child of the living God. That's great news. And what will we will, will be has not yet been made known. So he's telling us right off the bat, you are a child of God. You've entered into this process, but you don't see what the end product is, okay? And we don't see the process. But we know that when Christ appears, that's the end of time, we shall be like him. Woohoo! for we shall see him as he is. And so I just want, to, just want to tell you right off the bat, it's okay that you don't know where God is taking you and that you don't know what those particulars are. God is in the process of change and God's got this, okay? It doesn't matter that you don't got this, okay? So uh, this is kind of the way I think about. In this life, we are all in the chrysalis of change. 
Once you become a follower of Jesus, you enter into that process. You're all hanging upside down from a branch somewhere in the spiritual kingdom. And God is changing you and working in you in this, this radical sort of, of change. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit then about what this process looks like and some of the tools for that. Um, and so we're, we're not sure, but, but we're trusting God. Um, and here's what I also know to be true about that, and that is this. Everybody has room to grow, and growth means change. Everybody has room to grow. Unless you think you are God, you have room to grow, okay? And, and the hard reality about growth is that it means change. In order to grow, we have to change some things. We have to let go of some things. We have to embrace some things. We have to unlearn some things. We have to learn some new things. There, there's a process about that. And people respond to this in all kinds of ways. Uh, some people are in denial. You ever met somebody that thought they'd arrived and they were just in denial about the need to change or grow? Aren't they fun to work with? You know, it's just... Yay, you know, um, and then some Christians kind of take a laissez-faire attitude way of this, you know, oh, I'll just wait for the Spirit to zap me and make me into something, you know, and, and it's just whatever happens. And to, if you're in that kind of category, I, I want to say, step up your game. There's some really good things about, about this change process. But, but the way Christ intended it uh, was, was discipleship. He, he didn't, you know, zap the disciples. If you've ever read the Gospels, they were pretty rough around the edges, you know. They had some struggles and some things that went wrong, and they, they grew over, over time uh, and, and were changed. The chrysalis of change in their life so that towards the end, you've got some really great saints, but, but they didn't start out like that. Some of them were, like, really rough. Uh, and so um, there's an intentional process in becoming a disciple. Only God can create the change but you can participate in that change. There are things you can do uh, in all of that, and God wants to do something in your life. And so what we kind of want to talk about is God's tools for creating change in us. And you all know you have to have the right tool for the job, amen? You know, I mean, it, anybody's ever been to the dentist? Aren't you glad they have that little tiny drill rather than getting out that big thing that you use, you know, to drill it? You've got to have the right tool in order to Am I the only one that's afraid of the dentist? You know, you're all looking at me like, I don't care what kind of drill they use. It's okay. You know, it's no big deal. And so, and, 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 and you guys know this who are in construction. My son, a couple of years ago, spent a summer in construction home from college, and, and he was um, using a hammer all the time. And me, I'm a preacher. I don't really care a lot about hammers. I have like an $8 job from Walmart, right? But he was using it all the time, and so someone looked at it and watched him struggling and, and gave him a hammer. Turns out it's a $120 hammer. Like, who needs a $120 hammer? Well, if you make your living with it, you need a good hammer, amen? And, and so the tools are, are important in all of this when we're, we're changing. God has tools he uses on us, and, and, and we need to get that part right. And then the second part is um, we, we don't just start hammering things together and hope that it turns into a house, right? Oh, you all have a house you live in, you know. Somebody was very intentional about the process of, of, of building a, a house. They, they had to look at the original design specs. You got to say, okay, I've got to put this together and that together uh, in order to get at that house. And so we're going to look at these tools. So, but here's what I know with these two things, and that's this. What you will become is not clear. How you get there is. What God is changing you into, what God wants to do with your life, what you kind of butterfly you are going to be, what you are going to look like at the end is not clear. Only God can see that. But there is a change process that is important, and that's the same. Just like a houses look all different, but the fundamental process of building a house is the same uh, for, for everybody. In fact, I, I'm not much of a, a builder, and so I'm going to probably get myself in trouble because I want to use a building construction illustration. And good news for you is the 8 o'clock, some of the builders there straighten me out on a couple of things, so this is getting better. If I make a couple mistakes, let me know, and then we'll get it right for 11 o'clock. But, but if, if you're going to build a house... You, you do not start out by putting sheetrock up, right? In fact, in fact yeah, I said in the 8 o'clock service, I said, you got to start out with groundwork. And one of our builders came and said, no, actually, you got to start out by surveying the property. Aren't you glad I'm not a house builder? You know, that I didn't build your house because I would have missed that whole step. You know, you, gotta, you start out, the, you survey the property. And then before you build a house, you got to come in and do groundwork, right? And they, if you've driven down the street back behind the church, they're, they're like, all oh, this stuff everywhere. And they make a giant mess before they make it better. And then somebody's got to come in. they got to lay a foundation. There's concrete and all that sort of stuff, you know. And then somebody comes in and, and they start, you know, putting you know, framing it in and that kind of stuff. And then one of the months I missed in there, I guess the heating and guys and the plumbing guys got to get in there really early. Is that right, guys? 
just nod your head, yes, I don't know. So you'll, you'll be fine, you know. And then you got the wiring's got to go in there, and, and the roof's got to get in there. And then somewhere in there, somebody starts shooting, putting sheetrock up, and it starts to look like a house. But then it's not done. Then somebody else has got to go in and paint, you know, and you got all the particulars, and it gets more and more individual. But every house, every house, whether it's a multi-million dollar mansion or a little tiny place that you're hoping someday that you can get out of, it all kind of starts the same, and it all goes through the same process. So does that make sense? What you will become is not clear. The older you get, the more clear it becomes, but it's not clear. But how you get there is. And that's what we want to talk about, is how uh, to get there through this path. And, and I will trust that God will make you into what he wants you to be. He's making me into what he wants me to be. And so let's talk about the path uh, to spiritual growth. Again, if you have your... P uh, if you have your Bibles, this is in 2 Peter uh, today. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8 we're going to look at. Let me read this. His divine power, his power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Woohoo! Everything you need, God has for you. That's, that's the good news, okay? He, de he doesn't ever run out or forget to order supplies. God has everything you need. Uh, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promise. So God has made a promise to us. So that through him, you, you may participate in the divine nature. nature. Did you know that you get to participate in God's divine nature? That's a pretty good deal, okay? And escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. So you get God's nature and the promises, and you get to escape the brokenness and the sin of, of this world. And so now Peter, the next set, he's going to actually lay out the steps, and I want to talk about uh, this a little bit together. So uh, beginning uh, at, at verse uh, Five, I think. For this reason, okay, because he's doing all of that, make every effort to add to your faith, so you've already got faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, you see the, the, the progress there, increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to walk down through those individual ones because I went through them kind of quick because there's some really good stuff uh, in there. And so I want to talk about the spiritual growth uh, process that we go through and, and kind of being reminded of this Romans 12. You have been transformed. You will be transformed. And so the first one he talked about was faith. Everyone needs faith in Christ. You need intimate relationship with Jesus. We're all on board about that, right? Because I got another sermon if we're not, you know. But we all need faith in, in Christ. And, and, and faith here, I, I kind of define as full allegiance. You understand, when the Bible talks about faith, it certainly takes in the idea of does God exist, but it goes way past that. It's the idea of fully bought in to what Christ is doing. You are on God's team. You are, you are part of that. And so that, that's the beginning process, but that's not the end. That's just the very beginning. So the second thing he says is add to your faith goodness. And uh, the, the Greek word here is refer referring to the idea of moral goodness. And it's kind of the idea of, of eliminating those really difficult things in your life. It, it's very common when I see people come to Christ, there's some, some big issues in their life they kind of got to work through. Sometimes there's some addiction or there's some other things, you know. And it's, it's kind of like put out of your life those things that are destructive, that you know are destructive, those, those painful things. And this is why for new believers, you often see a lot of change really fast, that as you walk longer with the Lord, you don't see the change quite as much. But put into your life goodness. And then add to goodness, knowledge. And one of the things uh, I've said to you often is, in Greek, there's a number of words for knowledge. And most of the time, uh, when you see the word knowledge, it's talking about how you know someone, how a mother knows their children. It's more than just data. It's, it's intimate relationship. It's predicting them. It's Adam, New, Eve. It's that, that kind of close relational word. That's not the word that's being used here. <laughs> the word that's being used here is really the word that's pretty close to data. It means add to your, to, your, uh, to your newfound faith data about God. And so this is the idea of knowing God's word. Uh, we are a people of the book. We believe that the Bible is the, is the word uh, of God. Uh, and we believe that, that we need to have information. You need to know about God in order to know God. And so build into your life, you've got faith, build into your life goodness, and then build into your life knowledge of the Bible. You should read the Bible sometime. It's got some really cool stories in there. You'd be surprised. It's a ton of fun. Uh, so 
add that to your uh, as well. And then, that, so that's the first three that often are, are the big ones. And then he, he gets into some stuff that even as we mature, we tend to struggle with sometimes a little bit. The next one he says, add self-control. And this is the idea of mastering your passions, of those, those things that, you know, you do really good most of the time, but then that neighbor across the street does that thing he does, and then it's like, wah! Am I the only one that struggles with that sometimes? I've seen some of you, you know. And so it, it's, it's self-control. It's be the master kind of, of of your impulses and your urges. And, and sometimes we live in a society that kind of says, you know, if it feels good, do it. If you have an urge, it's okay, you know. That's, that's not true. Let me tell you, a lot of people, you give in to your urges and very often bad things happen to you. So add self-control. And then to self-control, add perseverance. And this is our favorite one. This is patience. This is in endurance. This is continuing on when it's hard. It's sustaining. It's, it's, it's waiting. You know, you're not really excited about this one, are you? You know, this is like, oh, I don't want to learn that. You know, that's hard. But that's a part of our spiritual development. It's a part of making us like Christ. So, so add to your self-control, add perseverance. So in some ways, self, perseverance is like self-control over the long haul. You know, it's like, okay, we'll do all of that. Then he says, add to that godliness. And this one's a little confusing in English, uh, but it, it's the idea of reverence. It's, it's the idea of a religious practice. It's, it's, uh, it's spiritual disciplines. It's those, those things where you take relationship with God seriously. It, it's showing up to church. It's, it's reading your Bible. It, it's praying. It's, it's all of those sorts of religious practices. Uh, it, sometimes I think of this as making relationship with God a habit. Build it into your life so you just do it automatically. And there, there's great power in habits. Habits are hard to change. And so if you build good habits in, it keeps you on the right path no, no matter what. And if you build bad habits in, it's difficult. And so very early on in my life, I developed a habit of, of some spiritual, uh, personal time with God. Every day I pray and I, I read his word and it's just kind of built into to who I am and, and, and what I am. And that's a good habit. That's what it's talking about. Build, build these things into your lives. It's, church attendance is a good habit. You know, I, I grew up in a time when it was kind of like if you weren't at church, you know, the little old lady in the third row would be like, where were you last week? You know, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I, I'm talking about that there's something powerful about spiritual habits. So add godliness into your life. Uh, and then the, the next one is brotherly kindness. Uh, and this is the idea of, of, um, of loving the people that love you, of, of dying for the people that would die for you. This is about loving your spouse. This is about loving your kids. This is about loving your relatives, even the weird uncle. This is about loving, you know, the people in your church and, and the people around you. This is the really good one. This is one of the great blessings of Christian faith is just brothers and sisters in Christ and getting to know them and, and loving each other through all of this. It is this idea that relationship matters. Relationship matters. In fact, when this series is over, the next one we're going to do is called Framly, and it's all about friends that are like family and your family. It's all about relationships and all of this, and so uh, it's an important sort of thing, and this is a really old idea. One of the things that I, I told you when we were doing the Ten Commandments that really struck with me about it, because you look at them at 30,000 feet, the, the first two are clearly about relationship with God, okay? But the, sec the third one is, is uh, the Sabbath one, and so that's about both relationship with God and relationship with one another. Sabbath, set time uh, uh, for God, and stop and spend time with family and friends. And all of the ones after that are all about horizontal relationship, not vertical relationship. So in the Ten Commandments, at best, three of them are about relationship with God, and seven of them are about brotherly kindness, about getting along with one another. This is a, a really big deal. And the good news is, most of our brothers and sisters, they are good, they're fun to love. You guys are good folks. I like you guys. Not only that, I love you guys. Amen? Now, here's the hard one. The last step, he says, is love, and the word he uses is agape. Agape means loving the people that don't love you. Agape is self-sacrificing love. Agape is being willing to die for the people that would kill you. Do you remember Jesus' words on the cross? Father, forgive them. That's agape love. This is the one that's the hardest of all to get to full agape. Lord, continue to transform me. Lord, I love to love the people I love. That is such a blessing. But the next step is to love the people that don't love me, the people that would wish me harm. Love your enemies. 
Christianity is a tough one. That's a high standard. And can I be honest? You cannot do that on your own. It's just not possible for us to do that. In fact, that this last one just takes it to a level of you just have to be kidding me that we would be able to do that. It's, it's discouraging. How am I going to? I'm not even sure I want to love the people that don't love me. They're not very nice, you know? And so we struggle with that. And so um, I, I want to give us the tools that God uses to move us up this, this pathway, the ways in which he works. Because if we understand the tools, we can help cooperate uh, with him. So uh, what we want to talk about is chrysalis tools, what God gives us to create change in our life. Um, and so I want to look first at, at John chapter 16, verse 7. It says this, Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Jesus is about to leave. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And the advocate is the, is the Holy Spirit. And um, a lot of times when you hear this word advocate, people will say, well, it's like a lawyer that, that speaks for you. And there's absolutely that is a part of this, this word. But actually the word literally means one who comes alongside you. And it's the idea of one who guides you and helps you in the process. I don't know if any of you have ever gone like with a, a fishing guide or a field guide that, that takes city slickers out into the wilderness and helps them have a great experience, right? That, that, that's probably pretty close to what we're talking about because, because the guide that, that takes them into the wilderness shows them the path to walk on, but he also helps them to learn how to do things, you know, how to survive in the wilderness. He's, he's alongside. He doesn't do it for them, but he, but he teaches them. He teaches them, by the way, you're going to have to build a fire. It's going to get really cold tonight, you know. He teaches them, watch out. You don't want to fall off that cliff. Why don't you move this way a little bit, you know? He, he, he guides and helps them in the process, and if they get into trouble, it's the guide's responsibility to rescue them. So there's a sense in which the Holy Spirit is our, is our field guide to life, that he is with us uh, in, in all of this. So then he goes on, uh, moving again a little further down in John 16. He says, I have much more to say to you. He's about to leave. Okay? He has not told us everything that we need to know in order to be like Christ. It is more than you can handle right now. There's an encouraging verse. You think you're maxed out right now? Oh, God's got more. Yay. But it is to say that God is not finished with you yet. That there are more things he wants to teach you. There are more ways he wants to grow you in all of this. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The role, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to guide you in this process of change, of becoming. And truth here is more than facts. It's about the, the truth of, of Christ. We will not speak, um, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is still going to happen. So he can see the future in, in all of this. And so just kind of to sum that up, I would say God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is both guide and helper in the chrysalis of change. And this is the single most important tool in your transformation process is the Spirit of the living God. The work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because this one is the one that, that helps you learn how to do all of the other tools. It is the field guide that can teach you how to use the hatchet or the knife or, or how to build a fire in this situation, or how to cross the river. All of the other tools come out of this tool, which is the Holy Spirit. And so we've talked about this before, but the, the Spirit of God working in you, this is the key to the change, to submit your life to the work of the Holy Spirit, to listen to the Holy Spirit. Do you know what happens to city slickers if they go in the wilderness and they don't pay attention to the guide? They die, that's exactly right, you know, or they get really, really miserable in, in their life. And, and so the Holy Spirit is the key. Say, the Holy Spirit is the key. Okay, so now let me talk a little more specifically about some of the other tools that the Holy Spirit uses, but the Holy Spirit is the key to all of this. Um, so how to hear the Holy Spirit uh, through this? The first one is through the Bible, through God's Word. And I know that seems really, really obvious, but this is the foundation for everything. We believe the Bible is the final authority on all things relating to spiritual life and practice. Amen? We take it really, really seriously. We believe that it was inspired when it was written. 
that the Holy Spirit was working through them uh, when, when they wrote the Word of God. We also believe uh, that it was inspired when it was preserved. We don't have all the writings of all the prophets and all the, every, but we have the ones that we needed. God preserved those. The Holy Spirit shepherded those to the day that we have them at this moment. And, and we also believe that the, the Word of God is inspired in the reading. When you read the Word of God, it's not like reading anything else, that the Spirit of the God is speaking to you in the midst of that. And I don't know about you, but I've had times when I'm just minding my own business, doing my devotions, I want to go to bed and get done with all of this, and all of a sudden the Scripture comes up and grabs me by the throat and shakes me around and says, pay attention, this is for you. That's, that's, that's the Word of God. In fact, 2 Timothy says it this, God has breathed life into all Scripture. There are only two things that God breathed life to, into in Scripture. One was us in Adam, and the second one was Scripture. It is useful for teaching us what is true, correcting our mistakes, making us live whole lives again, and training us to do what is right. This is the NIV reader's version. By using Scripture, the servant of God can be completely prepared to do every good thing. And so I cannot urge you enough <laughs> Listen to the Spirit of God and know His Word. Knowledge. Know His Word. I know that reading the Bible has kind of fallen out of favor and all of those sorts of things. Get a modern translation. Spend time in it. If you really want to learn a lot, the, the New Testament is really powerful. But there are some crazy, wonderful, and wild stories in the Old Testament. So you should read some of those sometime uh, too as well. So the Bible. The, the second way to hear the Holy Spirit is through godly counsel. Uh, and this is building into your life people that can speak God into you. God has always chosen to speak through people. In fact, I'm persuaded that one of the greatest gifts that's ever been given to me is that I've always had godly counselors, godly mentors, godly coaches, people that, that have just helped me along the way. I, I am really persuaded that I am vastly overperforming my talent because of the people that God has built into my life that have just helped me. And that is true as well, especially when we have to make uh, tough decisions. We live in this kind of radical individual individualism and, you know, I'll make my own choices. Don't make your own choices. Talk to godly people. The Spirit will guide you. Nobody's as smart as everybody, okay? And the Spirit works through people in that. So godly counsel. And um, let me just say it this way. Who you choose as counselors will profoundly impact the direction and speed of your life. Who you choose as counselors, who you let speak into your life, who you listen to, who you build into your life will profoundly impact the direction and speed of your life. And then the third way is prayer. There is just something powerful about this, but, but for the most part, we, we don't, we, well, how, how about if I said this? The primary purpose of prayer is listening, not talking. The primary purpose of prayer is listening, not talking. Now, talking is important. But most of my life, I, I, I just kind of give God my laundry list. Lord, if you could do this and do this and take care of that, and if you could do, do this and, you know, anyone else do that, you know? In, in fact, even though I know listening at this stage of my life, I still have to get through the laundry list before I'm ready to listen. I just kind of got to get it off my chest, you know? But man, if you will learn to listen in prayer, stop. Just shut up for a minute, you know? And say, speak, sir. speak, Lord, your servant is listening. You'd be surprised. And when you're regularly in prayer, it's amazing how often God speaks to you in that, in that moment. I, at this stage of my life, I never get down to serious prayer where I sit down without bringing something to write because God is always talking. He interrupts. You know, I've got, I got this and this and this. And he's like, no, no, I want to talk to you about this. No, 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 I got to get this. No, 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 I want to talk to you. Listen, listen, it's powerful. The Holy Spirit will use it, um, prayer very powerfully. And then there's circumstances. Uh, God speaks to us through our circumstances. Sometimes things come into our life we didn't expect. It changes things, you know, and, and God just guides us in that. So, and it, sometimes it's really good. Like every time I got a promotion, I was really sure that was God's will. You know, got more money, I'm sure that's God's will. And then I had a boss that demoted me. And I'm like, that's clearly not God's will. That's, that's not... God's. But little did I know that because of that, it opened up for another thing, and the promotion I was waiting for after that, I actually got more quickly, and my career in the grocery business really took off after that. Sometimes God is going to put into your life circumstances that are difficult, but you have no control over them. If you have no control over them, accept that the Lord is working in the midst of that. Amen? Even if it's not fun. Amen? 
<laughs> Got lower and a little quieter on that one, okay? And then, then the last one is interruptions to, of your life. Every once in a while, God will speak in a powerful way that just seems like he's talking to you and follow God. But those are rare. Everybody wants this one, but those are rare. The other ones are the way God primary work, primarily works. So let me real quickly then run through some just some wisdom things I've learned along the way. Number one, don't look down on people who are not as far on the path as you. Amen? I want to be a church when somebody comes in that doesn't know Jesus and they, you know, all of that stuff. We don't look down on them. We just love them. Amen. Because they're not as far on the path as you are. One day you were early in the path, but now you're on the other part of it. Uh, and if our musicians could come, we're going to wrap up here real quickly. And then number two is attitude is everything in our lives. Uh, attitude, I, I have found that it doesn't do any good to complain to God about stuff, you know, because he just keeps guiding us and directing us. Embrace the change. Embrace the change. Attitude is everything. And then the Holy Spirit is life. Let the Holy Spirit work in you in all that you do. Turn God loose in your life. You're amazed what he can do. And then just lastly, seek fruitfulness. You want a measure for how your growth process is going? This is it. Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that God would build this into... Wouldn't it be great if they said, you know, the, the people at Generations Community, they are, they're just full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That is what we are looking for. That's the chrysalis of change. That's the outcome. So we're going to worship the Lord in giving now, and then I'm going to come back and talk with you uh, just a little bit after we do this. If you're a guest, this is a great time to put that connection card uh, into the offering plate. Uh, we would love to follow up. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Uh, but let's continue to worship the Lord both in music and in, uh, and in worship and giving.